Hello, hello, and welcome once again to a Beatles talk show podcast that we call Things We Said Today, and we do this bi-weekly, every two weeks, and we talk about anything we feel like here on the show where the Fab Four are concerned, their years together, the solo years, their history, their music, anything that comes to mind, and especially in just about every show, we cover what's going on in the news. You get a very full, rounded show that way, talking about the past and the present in the same show. I'm Ken Michaels. I'm one of the three regular co-hosts of this show. Hopefully you are familiar with my syndicated radio Beatles show, which is called Every Little Thing, which runs on roughly 50 radio stations. And I also do another talk show podcast called Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. That's a bi-weekly show as well. And I have my own YouTube channel, which is loaded with Beatles content, interviewing everything from authors to fellow podcasters to musicians to anyone who's worked with the Beatles. And that's at Ken Michaels Radio. I'm being joined by my two good friends here, my two co-hosts. First of all, a man who has written several books on the Beatles, including uh, From the Cavern to the Rooftop, Got That Something, How I Want to Hold Your Hand Changed Everything, and the critically acclaimed book, The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, which he collaborated on with Adrian Sinclair. We anxiously await volume two. And I know that Alan is working feverishly around the clock to make sure that he gets it done, hopefully uh, by the end of this year. Fingers crossed. Alan Cozen, welcome. Hello, Ken. Hello, Darren. And hello, everyone. And of course, we have Darren DeVivo, who has been... Uh, One of the leading DJs in New York radio for 40 plus years. Don't, don't make a face like, no, I get get a little embarrassed. (laughs) How many people can make that claim to be on New York radio for that long? This is true. This is true. You are part of a rare breed. I knew that long before we got you involved with the show. (laughs) Yeah, I've heard that often about being a rare breed, yeah. So it's always great to have him here to uh, share his insights on the Beatles, his love and passion of the Beatles. Darren, hello. Hello. Hi, everyone. Hello, Alan and Ken. Great to be uh, here with our first show for the month of October. Yes, we're recording this on October 2nd. And since that happens to be the show we're recording before John's birthday, we thought we should do some kind of a tribute to John. And every now and then, Uh, There are anniversary shows that we do here, and um, John's Mind Games album came out October the 29th in the United States in 1973. Actually, in the UK, it was November 16th, but it was 50 years ago this month in the United States that John's Mind Games album came out. So we'll be talking a bit about that album and uh, find out what Alan and Darren think about it, their history with the album as well as mine, too. Um, And uh, we'll also talk about, you know, what we miss most about John. Really hard to believe that he's been gone longer than he lived. Oh, yeah. I just, I shake my head in in utter, you know, astonishment about that. It's been 43 years now since we lost John. But first we have... Uh, the latest in Beatle news, Ringo Starr gave an interview to the Associated Press where he talked about a number of topics, including his new EP, Rewind Forward. He said, people will be asking me, what's it mean? Rewind Forward. I think it means that you sit still for a while and you find that I was a much better person then or this was working for me better then. I'm going forward so you can carry on forward. You don't ever have to live in the past, but just check it occasionally he talked about paul's new song which is called feeling the sunshine he says we facetime each other twice a month and if he's in town we hang and if i'm in london we hang and he's all over it meaning the song uh which is great and when he did send the work track he'd actually done the drums so he had to take them off so (laughs) i drums and vocals and that was fun On the new EP, he says, this one's incredible because Ian Hunter sent me his files. Mike Campbell had a track, which I loved, so I put drums on it and sang it because that's how it worked. 
he's put everything else on. I don't know when I start, meaning with each project, where it's going. That's how it works. He actually says he's finished his country EP. It was my understanding that after Rewind Forward, the next EP was going to be the one with uh, um, Linda Perry involved with it. But he's saying now the country EP is finished, so maybe he still has to do the one with Linda Perry. Will he make another album again? He said, I don't know. You never know. Right now I'm EP crazy. On the All-Stars, he says, I love to play and I need to play in a band. I can't go out just with the drums. And you can still catch Ringo at the All-Stars. Their current tour wraps up October 13th. Ringo, you might have heard, fell on stage at the end of his concert with the All-Stars in Albuquerque after jogging onto the stage to sing Give Peace a Chance. He stumbled on his way to the microphone, but popped up on his own to join his bandmates. He joked about the timing of the tumble and the message in Give Peace a Chance. He said, I fell over to tell you that. Last week on Sunday, Ringo posted some happy news that he was given the honor of being the first recipient of the Joe Chamber Award in Nashville at the Musicians Hall of Fame. He says, I want to thank everybody who was there. Peace and love. While Ringo finishes up his tour on October 13th, Paul McCartney starts the latest leg of his Got Back tour in Australia at the Entertainment Center in Adelaide. That's only a few weeks away, folks. October the 18th. Paul will be appearing in an all-new series, Spins 100 Greatest Rock Stars, premiering on AXS TV on October the 2nd at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. That's actually tonight. Back in 1991, Paul McCartney composed and recorded his first full-scale classical work, the Liverpool Oratorio. This was to commemorate the Royal uh, Liverpool Philharmonic Orchestra's 150th anniversary. And now a first ever operatic staging of this work, inspired by Paul's early life, will premiere at Cincinnati Opera's 2024 Summer Festival. In a letter to the company, Paul said, I am writing to express my wholehearted support for this project. I believe the Cincinnati Opera is uniquely positioned to bring this work to life in a new way. And I have no doubt that your production will be an inspiring, inspiring experience for all who see it. I look forward to its premiere next summer. No word as to whether or not Paul will attend the premiere. Does that interest you at all, Alan? Operatic. Yeah, I would think. I, I would think that that would be something you'd have to go to because, uh, you know, and it, typically he's gone to the big premieres in London and New York of his works, but this is the, this will be the premiere of a staged version of it. Um, and, you know, presenting an opera is an awful lot of effort. I, I would think he would go, um, but we'll see. I think so too. I like the fact that periodically somewhere in the world, one of Paul's classical works is being performed somewhere. Hmm. But what's still out there, it's not like it just came out right. when it was at least, and they just leave it that way. So, uh, yeah. Also, there's a brand new Danny Harrison song. It's called Damn That Frequency. It's now available for streaming. Danny will have a new album out October the 20th called Inner Standing, from which you can find a new album trailer on YouTube. It'll be released digitally on that date, October 20th, and there'll be a special 2LP Neon a uh, yellow vinyl edition available on February the 9th. You can pre-order the album now. A couple of uh, concerts I want to tell you folks about. Every now and then you hear me bring up this show that takes place on Long Island every year from the band Wondrous Stories. Of course, they got their name from the Yes song. It's called The Concert for Bangladesh Revisited amazing musicians in the band wondrous stories and they always have special guests join them they do the entire concert for bangladesh including some indian music it may not be the same piece that ravi shankar played but they have something to represent that at the beginning of the show and they do everything they do the leon russell number the the, the um the medley they do uh hold the whole bob dylan set um billy preston you name it and of course 
Ringo and uh, all of Georgia songs. And then they do another set when all that's done of Beatles music. It's a really long show. Usually lasts about three hours. You get your money's worth. Um, it is such a great tribute that they do. And it takes place at the space in Westbury, Long Island. There'll be two shows, November 24th and 25th. I'm certainly going to try and see one of those two. I've seen the show, I think, three times already. Absolutely. It's one of the greatest, you know, performances you're ever going to see. And also, there's a tribute tour called All You Need Is Love. It includes members of Todd Rundgren's band, Chasm Sultan, Prairie Prince, and Gil Asias. Among, they are among the many performers that will take the stage. It's described as a state-of-the-art all-star tour to celebrate the Beatles' arrival in America. The same tour took place in uh, 2014 of the same name, which combined American and Canadian classic rock artists saluting the Fab Four. The same organizers have put this one together. It kicks off in Boston on January the 9th and so far runs through January 27th in Illinois, uh, with more dates to be announced. It will have state-of-the-art production and visuals, creating an immersive experience that will transport audiences to the golden era of the Beatles. And maybe what we will do is include a link in case any of you are interested in uh, seeing this tour. All right. Um, you may have heard recently that Denny Lane had to cancel a few of his gigs due to health issues. Nothing was revealed until now. Denny's wife, Elizabeth Hines, is saying that his condition is now critical. She says that Denny's been in and out of the hospital concerning an illness in his lungs that developed after a short bout with COVID last year. He's had multiple tests, x-rays, and scans that are ongoing, along with three surgeries, most recently for a collapsed lung, which includes an inserted chest tube, that is temporarily needed until his lung heals. He recently contracted a bacterial infection in his blood, which he is still battling, but seems to be under control. The doctors have explained, Elizabeth is saying here, that once he's medically well, he will need several weeks of physical and occupational rehabilitation. Danny does not have medical insurance. The hospital has been working with us, with them, uh, regarding this problem, but a rehabilitation center, along with the multiple lab work and specialists, will not. Denny is unable to fly due to his medical condition, and uh, he needs to avoid long-distance drives. Um, they're saying he has to remain in Naples to recover. Now, Elizabeth has started a GoFundMe page to help pay for Denny's medical costs, and we're going to include that um, as a link in our description box here for this show, if any of you would like to donate something to help Denny for his medical costs. Really sad to hear all this news about Denny Lane. And of course, we wish him well. Such a big part of our lives. Mm -hmm. Of course, going back to the Moody Blues and all his years collaborating with Paul and Wings. And uh, just saw him in concert that not that long ago. It was a solo show, him alone on acoustic guitar. He was fantastic. So um, do check out the description box if you would like to make some kind of donation for this GoFundMe page for Denny Lane. All right. Since August the 30th, this is all for the Badfinger fans, of which many Beatle fans love Badfinger. Since August the 30th, these Pete Ham albums were made available for the first time since they went out of print on CD. There's 7 Park Avenue, Golders Green, and Keyhole Street. They were released as digital downloads for the first time and also made available to all streaming services for the first time. Keyhole Street hasn't been available for over 10 years, and 7 Park Avenue and Golders Green haven't been available for over 20 years. 7 Park Avenue and Golders Green are now available with the expanded track listings from the Japanese editions of the CDs. Keyhole Street is available as two separate volumes due to the large number of tracks, one volume for each CD. And a big thank you to Tom Brennan, our bad finger expert, for sending us this information. All right. And that's uh, all the news that we have for you this time. 
As I said, uh, we're doing our show this time as a tribute to John. This is our show before John's birthday, October the 9th. And I thought we'd talk a bit about the Mind Games album since it was 50 years ago uh, this month that the album came out in the United States, uh, October 29th being the date. Some background information about Mind Games. It was recorded in July and August of 73 at the record plant in New York City. The album itself peaked. There you have it. Hey. The album peaked at, wouldn't you know it, number nine in the United States, peaked at number 13 in the UK. The single from Mind Games peaked at number 18 in the US, number 26 in the UK. This was recorded at the beginning of John's separation with Yoko, also at a time when John was battling with uh, ongoing problems with the US immigration authorities. And John used some of the same musicians that Yoko used on her recent album at the time called Feeling the Space. John actually produced this album. After three years working with Phil Spector, John was listed as the sole producer for it. And so I thought what we do is uh, ask each of you what your first impressions were of this album, if you remember what it was like the first time that you heard it, and where it all falls in place. Because um, certainly depending upon our age and what we listen to first, it's not necessarily, uh, it doesn't have to be that we listen to everything chronologically as it came out. But uh, we'll start with you, Darren, what you remember about um, Mind Games the first time that you heard the album. And were you someone that tried to listen to John's catalog chronologically? Or did you just, you know, pick and choose whichever albums you wanted to hear? I, I, I admit uh, I'm guilty that when John was murdered on December 8th, 1980, at that point, I only owned one John Lennon album, and that was Shaved Fish. Hmm. My collection up to that point was pretty much singles. Um, Power to the People came out either on or the day before my seventh, sixth birthday, 71, sixth hmm. birthday. Uh, and that started uh, having Lennon singles, and Mind Games was one of the singles uh that i had i loved mind games from when um i first heard it and years later when i became to learn when i you know was learning more i was surprised that it wasn't a bigger hit because i remember hearing it on the radio in new york city it would have been wabc mm. music radio uh i remember it being played a lot and i was surprised that it wasn't even a top 10 hit in the U.S. because it sure as heck seemed to be all over the radio the song Mind Games and that's really where my exposure to that album that's where it stopped Mind Games and the B-side Meat City um, uh, until again until the point when John died I mean of course I mean, I think I could speak for everyone here when you're a kid uh, you, you got to depend on gifts and allowance uh hmm. when it came to what you would buy and you picked and choose by you know the few albums i would get maybe at a time a handful of albums over the course of a year and with john sitting out the second half of the decade he might have kind of fallen off my radar a little bit as i was catching up with uh, keeping up with wings and george harrison but mainly catching up with the beatles with discovering the Beatles music. Mm -hmm. I've said this before on the show that at Christmas time was always the time for me that I would get another load of Beatle albums um, from the current compilations that were new at the time, like rock and roll music and love songs, um, to getting randomly um, the original albums from the 60s. And, and, and it was my mom who, who would get do the shopping and she just would go to the uh, clerk at Sam Goody or Record World and say here's a list to Santa and he loves the Beatles and I think it was pretty much random from there as a result of that when it came to Solo Lennon I didn't really discover a mind games until I bought it and I think my I had I um I got it at some point in the early 80s. And to me, initially, Mind Games was fine and all, but it didn't jump out at me right away. 
Mm -hmm. It was years later that I realized all of the gems that were kind of hidden on this album because it only had one hit and it didn't really have too many other radio tracks. I don't recall FM radio. I really wasn't listening to FM AOR rock radio in 73 yet. I don't remember too many tracks other than the title cut getting played on the radio. So, um, so it didn't, it, it kind of in, even in my book fell through the cracks uh, until again, time as the eighties wore on and I spent more and more time with everything. Mm -hmm. I realized that there were so many gems on mind games. And I think a lot of people have rediscovered. This is another one of those late rediscovery albums in my book. I remember it being at FUV in my first years. And one of the other uh, DJs telling me that her favorite Lennon album was mind games, which I thought was, unusual because it was not an album that i thought of right away in fact it was one of the last ones i would think of but that was only because that was how i was getting exposed now i kind of refer to it today as the uh, kind of poor man's imagine <laughs> um musically it's kind of cut from a very similar cloth as imagine hmm. it gets lennon back on track after some time in new york city which regardless of you know how it d d fared, and how the critics, how the how the uh, how the um, critical reaction to it was. It was a different record than what Imagine was um, musically. Mind Game sort of got John back on that course of the well-written, very literal uh, pop songs, um, and he did that so very well. Um, and that, and I think, unfortunately, a lot of people didn't. And I don't know if sometime in New York City changed people's perception of Lennon, but to me, the j real Lennon gems are on Mind Games and Walls of Bridges, and mm -hmm. it seems that too many people have looked past those two albums. And I think those are my two favorite of, of favorite albums of John's. I think uh, when it comes to wanting to listen to a Lennon album in the car or while I'm relaxing. Plastic Ono Band, it, that takes a little work. Got to be in a certain headspace for that. Um, and I I like Mind Games and Morals and Bridges more than Imagine, for whatever reason. Um, so it's grown uh, enormously uh, in my book, uh, in, in the, you know, maybe over the past 25 years or so. Um, and hopefully, hopefully some press goes to the album later in the month as we actually arrive at the 50th anniversary. That might prompt others to to take it out and put it on again. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, in a way, you kind of answered one of my other questions I was going to ask both of you. You know that um, shortly before he died, when he assessed his own work, he listed his best albums as being Plastic Ono Band, Imagine, and then Double Fantasy. So he was really dismissing that middle period there. And I'm kind of like you, Darren. I love Mind Games and Walls of Bridges probably more than any other uh, two Lennon albums. Although <sighs> Imagine's got a lot of gems and chestnuts on mm -hmm. it. And, and artistically, Plastic Ono Band is such a brilliant piece of work. But, um, yeah, it, it, how do you both feel about that? And I, I do want to get to you, Alan, about your initial impressions about Imagine, about how John looked at his catalog. Hmm. Uh, Darren, as long as you were just talking about it, and then we'll ask Alan. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that. Yeah, I don't, know, I don't think I ever heard John say that. Um, I mean, I mean, there's no denying that the Plastic Ono Band and Imagine albums are major works, and they are, they should be the ones that maybe get most of the attention when you're talking about John's solo catalog. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, Plastic Ono Band was a totally unique record at the time. Even, I don't know if it's totally accurate to say this, but I don't know how much... Uh, um, Introspection, is that a word? Uh -huh. I don't know how much introspection 
Bob Dylan did up to at that point in 1970. You know, um, Dylan tended to be right outward. I don't think there was too much looking inward until maybe later on, Blood on the Tracks, obviously, dealing with a broken relationship. Um, I'm sure other artists wrote personal, from a personal standpoint, but Plastic Ono Band just like knocked it out of the park both in its execution and in its effect. Mm -hmm. And imagine, of course, John realized, all right, if I take that mindset and put some whipped cream and sprinkles on it, I can actually appeal to the pop audience and still get my messages across. And he did. So those two albums deserve to be put up on the pedestal. But as, I don't know, but like I said, Plastic Ono Band, it sort of stands out on its own. Nothing else like it from any of the Beatles. And it I find it hard to compare it to anything else. It goes on its own little island. Mm -hmm. um, and um, maybe it's because there's so much attention being given to Imagine and Plastic Ono Band that I gravitate to mind games and walls and bridges. My connection to walls and bridges actually uh, goes back to when John was... was um, killed because uh the friday after his murder which i guess was two days before the moment of silence in central park which was a sunday i went down to the decoder now you can laugh at me make fun of me i was 14 years old i was just i was an only child i still am actually um and fairly sheltered and to me manhattan was like going to iceland okay i was from the bronx and that was my world my world was my neighborhood and going outside of that world only happened when I was in the backseat of the car with my folks going somewhere, mm -hmm. usually shopping against my wishes. But that's another discussion for another time. So when my dad was available with his work schedule to take me down to the Dakota, it was Friday. I did have school the next day. So that late afternoon on that Friday after John's death, I went down, I had a flower um, to put on the gate. Unbeknownst to me, they had removed them by that point. So I gave the flower to the security guard uh, that was in that, that gold booth. And I think my mom came out of the car with me. My dad was probably illegally parked. He didn't, he stayed in the car. And then my mother went in the car and I just was sort of, I don't even know what, how I felt. I don't know what the emotions were at that point. I'm still not quite 15, but somebody who had a boom box who was sitting along the wall at the Dakota, well, a guy was sitting all by himself and he was blasting. It was clearly Lennon, but it was stuff I'd never heard. And I was there long enough maybe to get a couple of two or three songs. In, and then I asked him, what are, you, what are you listening to? And he says, it's the Walls and Bridges album. To this day, Walls and Bridges takes me back to mm -hmm. that week in December. And Mind Games is an album that I always sort of just connected musically to Walls and Bridges. So that whole period is important to me. You know, and maybe that's just maybe that one little, what it could have been, 20 minute visit to the to the Dakota is uh, is what did it. But um, the other thing, of course, that, that slowed me down with getting into Lennon was that once I was beginning to get old enough to, okay, develop a taste and see what I like, John stopped making music. He was mm. off the radar. So he may very well have been off my radar, too, for a few years, because I remember being all excited hearing that Just Like Starting Over and Double Fantasy were coming, because these were going to be the first you know, of a more aware Darren, his first Lennon album coming. Yeah. It's really something how you can attach a memory to a specific song, like you just said, with you know, when you think of Walls and Bridges. We can all relate to that, whether it's a song or an album uh, that stands. I, mean, I, don't remember, I don't remember how many cups of coffee I had this morning, but I actually can still, in my mind, picture the guy hmm. sitting cross legged up against the the wall outside the Dakota uh, listening just with his boombox 
Right. Uh, you know, the whole, you heard it through the whole neighborhood. Uh, and he was playing Walls and Bridges, as it turns out. Yeah. Alan, uh, your first impressions and your comments about how John assessed his albums, like I had mentioned before. Yeah, let's start with that one, because um, <clears throat> like Darren, I don't remember hearing him say that, but I can kind of understand why he might have, um, just because that middle period, um, you know, was a certain amount of turmoil for him. Um, you know, I think May Pang would 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 challenge that, and I I don't I don't mean it in the way that people often say. I mean, you know, we've followed pretty closely what he did during that period, and he had some great times, and um, you know. Uh, recorded some great stuff, also got into some trouble um, out in LA and um, was, you know, maybe drinking too much and um, getting a bit too rowdy. And, um, and, I, and I think May would admit that too, because, you know, it's in her book. <laughs> um, uh, but, um, but I, I think, you know, maybe he looks at or looked at uh, Plastic Ono Band and imagine as, you know, the beginning of, of the career, then uh, sometime in New York as, you know, more topical and ephemeral, you know, um, and then these two as being kind of a, a, a troubled period in one way or another, and then five-year gap and then double fantasy. And if he's talking at the end of his life, he's going to be sort of promotional towards double fantasy anyway, because that was the album that he was talking about in those final interviews. So um, mm. I think, you know, we would, if he, had he lived, we would want to um, see how we look back at the whole career now and, and whether he reevaluated walls and bridges and mind games, which he might've, um, so my first impressions of it, uh, I had been really disappointed by some time in, in New York City, uh, especially after Imagine and Plastic Ono Band, which uh, both of which I thought were brilliant albums. And some time in New York City to me seemed sort of... Um, you know, half baked in a way. A lot of it was acoustic and, uh, you know, not the kind of production values that he brought to imagine, at least I thought. And at the time, um, there was the second album, which had some live stuff, some of which was pretty interesting and some of which was less interesting. But, um, but the album itself, I, I don't know, I didn't know what to make of it. And, you know, I had been a, a huge John Lennon fan up to that point, all through the Beatles era and up to that point. And, and I felt that I just felt a little let down by that album. So when I heard Mind Games, um, by then I was up at school, which was Syracuse, um, driving in my car the first time I heard any of it. Um, and I think, you know, Mind Games came on the radio and uh, the Mind Games, the song. And I thought, okay, that's more like it. That's like like as if as if some time in New York City never happened in a way, because like Darren said, he was now back to writing, you know, more conventional pop songs uh, with the kind of production values of 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 Imagine, you know. Uh, and then as I heard more and more of the album, I I I really liked it. Um, I'm not sure I liked it as much as Plastic Ono Band, which um, I liked the really hard edge of. Um, and I don't even know how I thought of it in terms of Imagine, but I, I know that I liked the songs on it. I, I liked I liked that it was so personal. You know, a lot of those songs are, you know, it would be hard for someone else to cover. Um, just because they're so specifically about his life and him and Yoko. And, uh, you know, I mean, there, there are some that aren't, but, uh, but a lot of them are. And, uh, you know, that, that kind of 
kind of made him in a way a different kind of songwriter than most, you know, most songwriters, including the Beatles as the Beatles, uh, wrote songs that anybody was expected to be able to pick up and make a cover of, you know, but these were so specifically about John and his life and Yoko that it, it would be sort of hard for someone who wasn't one of them to do unless you're going to leave out verses or change the words. But I hate when people do that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, that, that was that was my first impression that, you know, this is John and he's back. Was happy that he was back. Going back to sometime in New York City, were you disappointed with the album because maybe you didn't like the direction John was going by associating with all the political figures that he did? Um, or was it just a simple case of you didn't like the songs? It was a case of I didn't like the songs because I I, I was totally on board with John's politics. Hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, although... Uh, John Sinclair, for instance, didn't mean an awful lot to me, um, you know, but on the other hand, I knew what the song was about. I knew it was about a guy who was, you know, busted and put in jail for for pot, which um, at at the time I had not experienced, but uh, or maybe I had you know, some, <laughs> some time in New York City. I don't think I really had. Um, but, you know, so that was a little distant from me other than that um i wasn't against it you know um and generally speaking my feeling about john and his politics uh was that i i saw john as kind of a, a guide you know i was a teenager during you know the earliest part of his career and you know and so he, uh, you know, he had a, a message that sort of I just sort of took on board as, uh, you know, OK, this is what John thinks. I trust John's opinion. Um, and so I'm, I'm fine with it. But the songs to me seemed they just seemed sort of half baked. They didn't seem really worked on and. um I, I, I'm pretty sure that my dislike of the album was musical, not political. Right. political I, I was okay with it politically. All right. Well, I just know that in my case, um, so many of uh, the solo albums of the Beatles, I liked when they first came out and then grew to love even more as the years went on. You know, Sometime in New York City was a difficult album to some degree, because I was a little kid then, I had I didn't really understand what John's politics were, and half the album were Yoko songs, which was an adjustment to make, even though I liked a lot of Yoko's material on there. Um, I have grown to really love Sometime in New York City. It really stands out as being very different, having Elephant's Memory in the band there, and it was a very raw album, and... Um, yeah, I just uh, certain songs on on Sometime in New York City I've grown to really appreciate. Um and I like Yoko's material as well. But when it came to Mind Games, um I like the album and and like most albums there are certain songs that I like instantly and certain songs that are like oh, it's okay and then later on those songs really grow on you. Um you know, I, I always have felt and feel even stronger now that the song Mind Games is, is one of the best songs he's ever done and one of his greatest singles. And, uh, you know, even though production isn't nearly as important to me as the quality of the song, I love the production on the song Mind Games. It almost does have a, you know, a Phil Spector kind of sound to it anyway. Um, there's a lot going on in the arrangement there uh, of that song. But um, there are songs that really stood out as being amongst John's best um, on Mind Games. And I mean, I instantly loved I Assume a Sin. Yep. Um, yep. Bring On the Lucy, I loved immediately. The Hall Side 2, um, although only people I don't like as much as I used to, I feel like it's kind of a forced song where he was trying to be maybe a little bit too commercial um on there 
uh, more of his slogan rock, only people know just how to change the world. Um, but everything else on site too is absolutely brilliant. And I'm glad to see in recent years when you have a compilation uh, like Give Me Some Truth was a few years ago that certain songs like Out the Blue or I Know I Know um, Out the Blue was on a compilation called Working Class Hero as well. When you put those songs on these compilations and you mix that with the more familiar Lennon songs, hopefully more people will come to appreciate them. Um, you Are Here is an absolute gem uh, to me. And uh, Meat City, I love as a rocker. Kind of wish it was a little bit longer on the album. But um, yeah, I think Mind Games has become my favorite Lennon album. And I think it benefits in a way because it doesn't get the airplay that an album like Imagine got. And I do remember when Imagine first came out that album cuts were played on rock radio. It wasn't just the song Imagine. But like Darren said, when it came to Mind Games, I don't really remember anything other than the title track getting played on yeah. radio. Um, so in a way, these songs, even though I've heard them so many times now, these songs are kind of fresh because they're not played as much as the songs from Imagine. Uh, Back then, also, Ken, wasn't it true? You might remember, and Alan would, might remember better than I did. Even if you had, like, in New York City, a radio station like WABC, uh -huh. uh, a hit radio they would have they would sprinkle in an album cut or two every so often it wasn't solely a single right i think i remember seeing a chart once where they had like a deep deep cuts so maybe they had 10 songs that they had in rotation from the current albums that were out because well, i could swear i remember hearing Je jealous guy on the radio okay and that would have probably been i would think wabc See, I don't remember Jealous Guy being played on that station. Yeah. Possible. I just remember that the Beatles were the exception to the rule because they played a lot of album cuts from the Beatles, especially when Meet the Beatles came out. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just, I want to hold your hand and play right. something standing there. So, um, yeah, there were plenty of album cuts through the years. Michelle was treated like it was a hit. <laughs> yeah. You know, was sure. played, yeah. You know, um, even though it wasn't a single by the Beatles anyway. But uh, no, I don't really remember deep cuts being played on ABC. I could be wrong. If anyone watching this wants to correct us, correct me, please do so. But um, Mind Games, I think, because of the fact that even the songs that were like slow burns for me, I really love them now. Um, you know, One Day at a Time, I wasn't crazy about when it first came out. Now I love it. I also love the other version that's on the, the Lennon Anthology box set where he's singing in his regular voice as opposed to the falsetto one on Mind Games. But because of the fact that I think that Mind Games really, from start to finish, now is a really solid album. And um, I just really cherish those songs like Out the Blue and I Know I Know especially and You Are Here um, and I See Masen and the title track and Intuition you know, really and truly every song except maybe only people. Um, I just think that it's such a solid album through and through that it's become my favorite. Although Walls and Bridges is right, you know, neck and neck with uh, with Mind Games these days. Is this an album today that you go back to every now and then, Darren? Yeah, I, I listened to it yesterday. I mean, I, I listened to it yesterday, but I also did listen to it. I didn't have to because of this show, recording this, and I knew we were going to talk about Mind Games, but I had it on yesterday. <clears throat> and I remember that um, in my early years at WFUV, when <laughs> a few times I did this, you know, the dreaded dead air, you know, when you were on the air. What you, it used to happen to me on the overnights, usually back when I was in a record cabinet getting, you know, some, some more albums to play, you didn't make it back in time to the studio mm -hmm. to get the next song on. And it was always a little bit of silence. Um, the way I moved today at 58, I mean, there would probably be a half an hour of dead air between some songs, but a few times I actually, when actually, when I would back announce jokingly would back announce that, you know, before, um, before 
um, Knife Edge from Emerson Lincoln Palmer. We heard John Lennon's International Newtopian, the the Newtopian International Anthem, which was the dead air that was in between the two songs. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, no, it's definitely it's it's really when it comes to Lennon stuff, Walls and Bridges for me is my favorite. I like it a little more, slightly more than Mind Games. Walls and Bridges, Mind Games, those are one and two for me. Double Fantasy, Rock and Roll, the next two that I will tend to go to. Mm-hmm. And uh, and I do find that when the fall sets in and we hit John's birthday and we approach, you know, because I remember the anticipation to when I heard just like starting over was in October of 80. And the album fought Double Fantasy followed a roughly a month later. The fall always seemed to have some something something that was Lennon in the air for me. And, uh, you know, Mind Games is always a record I go to all the time. Um, favorite tracks? Uh, we'll get to that in a moment. Okay. That's what now, I think it up. Back to this album? Periodically? Um, well, not that often. Um, you know, every now and then, I guess, if I'm if I'm... Uh, rifling through things to hear something I'll, I'll put on maybe a few of the tracks, but maybe not the whole album um, because I tend to skip around a lot these days too much to listen to. Mm. Yeah. Well, I always listen to mind games partly due to the fact that I have a radio show where I have to program the music. So I mix the group and the solo stuff together. And I always love featuring a track from mind games but the songs are so burned into my brain at this point, And I'm really glad that they are. I really think that it's such a strong album from start to finish that um, I just have nothing but, you know, good things to say about mind games all these years later. Um, favorite songs, as we mentioned a few moments ago, Darren wants to share his favorites. Funny you should ask that. Um, you know, my favorites are the single mind games, uh, is my, one of my all time favorite Lennon songs. Mm -hmm. Um, and you don't really need my descriptions or explanations. Why Uh, to me, it's just a very powerful moment for John. Again, I surprised that it never wasn't a bigger hit in the United States. Uh, my other favorite from the, I actually have four I'd like to single out, but the other one that I would say is my other favorite is meat city. Because to me, Meat City is off the wall. John it is rocking it, rockingest, best, rockingest, rockingest. It John did the rock and roll thing better than most, and if not better than everyone. And Meat City is just such a great rock and song, and it means nothing. And you get the little that little, uh, you know, the weird little vocal trick in there which used to always make crack me up when i was a kid having no idea what it was um and a song called meat city it just resonated with me again it's when you're young and impressionable uh and till this day i anticipate coming to the end of um mind games to hear meat city uh and then the other two sleepers that i just want to single out are um uh, bring uh, bring on the Lucy, free to people. Um, again, lyrically, Lennon near the top of his game politically, and um, and then you are here, and I know, I know. Hmm. Yeah, those 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 are my faves on the on the album. You are here is gorgeous, uh, so easy. That's a good example of the song on an album that tended to fall through the cracks. That was a song that would fall through the cracks. Um, and, you know, you spend time with the album, you get towards the end, and you are here, and I know, I know, we're both such great songs. So, but Mind Games and Meat City, probably because there was the single that I played a bazillion times when I was a kid. You know, those, those are the go-to tracks from that album for me. I love all those songs, Darren, but we, we could have, we, we could have, uh, we could, we certainly needed more meat cities in John Lennon's catalog. Yeah. 
Yeah. <laughs> uh, meat aside, for those vegetarians, I apologize for going this way, but then Mind Games gave us beef jerky, which was another one of those rockin' great Lennon songs that's a, a, a one of my favorites as well. Mm-hmm. And a little meat, beef jerky in Meat City. Actually, I should write that down. Because that could be a segue on FUV at some point. Okay. Um, Alan, what are your favorite songs from Mind Games? Um, you know, there really aren't any bad songs on here. Uh, but uh, I would I would also have to go with Mind Games. I mean, it's um it's a great song. Uh, and it's, you know, I don't know, a, a lot of people have heard it's Genesis, uh, as as you were saying, a, a slogan rock song as was going to originally be called Make Love, Not War. Um, mm-hmm. And there is that, uh, I don't know how many people have seen any of, of it, but there's all that film that Tony Cox made in early 1970, around the time they were recording um, uh, Instant Karma. Mm-hmm. Uh in fact, it, during the days he was filming, they went on top of the pops and did Instant Karma, and he filmed that as well. Um, but he also filmed John, you know, sitting in bed working on Make Love Not War. So that song goes back three years before this album. Um, and I think the change to Mind Games and the lyrics of, of Mind Games as a whole is big improvement um you know make love not war not a bad message it was a message we were hearing a lot at the time but uh but mind games uh is it's sort of like a a cut above um i really like one day at a time uh no one's mentioned that yet um it's a little maybe it's a little poppy and you know sweet and everything but i like that it's you know it's it it shows john's melodic side which doesn't always get uh a lot of attention um especially because paul's melodic side is so you know striking that um people think of john as you know he's the rocker so he doesn't have to have a melodic side but one day at a time nice track um I assume Usain as well, you know, that's, that's another one that was immediately striking. Um, And since both of you have um, talked about Meat City as, you know, a great John Rocker and how we need more of those, um, I'll go with Tide As. (laughs) Hmm. So, you know, I I think I, I'm not sure I've consistently liked that song over the years, but um, when I played it, uh, you know, just the other day and again this morning, it it uh, it it really sort of grabbed me that just the 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 power of of the playing and the arrangement and everything uh, out of the blue, you know. But the thing on on this album, with the obvious exception of Newtopian, Newtopian International. <laughs> anthem which is you know it's out of tune (laughs) um you know there's there's there are really no bad tracks here um i do remember uh in one of the beatles biographies i think it was uh it might have been peter brown's and um i think peter brown knew the stuff well enough for this to have been blamed on his ghostwriter stephen gaines but they mentioned Utopia National Anthem and just say it, it wasn't very memorable. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. It's the shorter version of two minutes of silence. That's right. Yeah. Which is a shorter and minute. And his page is 433. Yeah, right. I was just saying, his, his, his condensed dance remix of 433. Well, even though you heard me say that I like all the songs on the album, Only People less than the others but what really stands out for me are the title track i always loved i assume a sen and back when i first started doing my Beatles show in new jersey on wdha david spinoza was there at the station and um he was a great guest to have and he told me that the guitar solo that he did on i assume a sen was one take it's the mm. first take yeah it's and a good so yeah it's such a perfect solo there i love the bluesiness of i assume a sen it's another one of those apologetic songs, kind of like Jealous Guy. Um, I love Intuition a lot. I think it's a great side two opener. Mm-hmm. And I 
don't know if it could have been a big hit, but I could have seen that as possibly a second single. And when it comes to love songs, I think Out the Blue and I Know I Know and You Are Here are three of the best in John's solo career. You Are Here is such a beautiful song, and I love the whole message of two people from distant lands and 3,000 miles apart coming together. And I love the message in that. Mm-hmm. Um, the whole arrangement of it, the, it, it sounds like a, you know, like a tropical song, like a breeziness there uh, in it. Kind of like uh, what George would do on uh, on Gontrapo, kind of has that kind of feel to it. Um, yeah, and Meat City, you know, I love the craziness of it. I love the edginess of it. It's just too short a song. It's under three minutes. Needed another minute and a half, I think. But yeah. those are my favorites. And um, I know, Darren, you just said that Walls and Bridges ranks number one and Mind Games number two. For you, Alan, where would you place Mind Games in John's catalog there? Probably in the middle, I guess. I don't know. It probably would be in the middle, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I have a hard time ranking his albums because every time I do it, it's a it's different ranking so um it's it's kind of difficult with his too because i said earlier john lennon plastic ono band almost stands on itself on its own hmm. you know it's it's not an album that you could say oh you put it on at a party oh that's the one to go by when i'm suggesting to someone who doesn't have any lennon records hmm. i was always with the caveat it's a diff can be a difficult listen if you're not prepared for that sort of introspective raw bare bones album um so it is hard to kind of rank lennon's and and the other sad thing is it's just not enough there to really you know do it up a proper ranking yeah well like i said for me it's 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 number one i do think it's the most overlooked album in john's solo career and for anyone that's used to just knowing the hits, the most popular cuts from John. If you want to go deep, and sadly, there aren't too many albums to go to, um, definitely I recommend Mind Games. There's a lot, like like Darren said, a lot of gems, a lot of nuggets on, on Mind Games for us all to enjoy. Okay. Um, why don't we just ask each of us, because... Um, like I said, it's it's just so hard for me to believe how long it's been now since we've lost John. What is it about him? I mean, he's such a fascinating person, such a tremendous talent in so many ways, um, whether it's the music, whether it's something about him as a person. What is it that you miss the most about him after all this time? Alan, why don't we start with you? Yeah, you know, well, the music, I I I'd love to know where he would have gone, you know, over the last 43 years. Um but also uh I think a large part of what I miss about John is the sort of personality, uh the you know, those those long interviews he used to do on, you know, Howard Smith's show, uh, you know, on the radio and uh, where, you know, in Rolling Stone or wherever, you know, he, he is someone who, if he was ready to do an interview, would commit to it, you know, he'd sit down, he'd give you as much time as you needed, apparently, and mm. would speak in depth about anything you asked him about. Um, and I liked his political stance i like the fact that he was willing to to talk about these things uh and i think that these days we really need someone like that and i think he would be quite outspoken now uh he would have been quite outspoken over the last uh six or seven years and i think um really his voice is is needed and missed so so there's that Hmm. well said darren i mean i could i could just generalize it and say everything because i didn't really ever get to enjoy and know john 
you know, again, for the reasons I mentioned earlier on, I was too young. I was 10 years old in 75. I was, wasn't even 15 yet when he died. No, I was 15 when he died. Um, but there was those quiet years where he was sort of off the radar, second half of the 70s. So, you know, I often wondered what would have happened after Double Fantasy. Uh, would, would Milk and Honey have been the next album? How quickly would he have put that out? Um, the tour that was coming, supposedly, um, you know, how how would that have sounded and how would that have gone and uh, where would he have gone from there? Would he have been bit by the touring bug? You know, like sort of McCartney was off off the road for many, many years. But once he went back on in 89, it seemed like he never strayed too far from the concert stage or for too long. How would John have taken to that? Would he have been someone to tour off and, or only occasionally, or not like and not like it? Maybe not do it. Um, <clears throat> I do think that had he been able to hit the road uh, with Double Fantasy and whatever Milk and Honey would have been, I do think that that would have been uh, a rather celebratory tour. I think that would have been a lot of fun because John was had Yoko at his side and it was just like the dam had burst. He was back in the spotlight. He was having hits. Maybe his confidence was would be up, would be up. The doubts that he might have had about being relevant would have been out the window. Hmm. Um, I also would love to have seen how he would approach a lot of uh, the current events. Um, would John have been very very vocal? Would he have, would he have been someone like a like like a Roger Waters who seems to be more and more vocal as he's gotten older? Would John have mellowed with age? There are those that think that double fantasy was an indication that there might have been a mellowing with age. I don't know. Um, maybe for that one album he did, but. Um, and you know what I often think about, you know, when I got older and you'd go down, I'd go down to the city to see a show or have dinner with friends. Um I wonder what it would have been like to be strolling, even if it was like what my my wife and my kids when they were little going to the um, the Museum of Natural History, which is right near the Dakota, and how cool it would have been to be walking down the block and here comes John, mm -hmm. and you could meet him, you know, and f not be too nervous about saying hey, you know, and having a conversation with him, and he'd be up for it how fun that would have been to maybe bump into him once or twice on the street. Um, and none of that had, you know, we had the opportunity to, I never had that opportunity. Um, so I could go on and on about all the things that I would miss and would have liked to have heard and seen and experienced when it comes to, uh, to John, because I was too young to really get it, appreciate it when it was there. Hmm. Well, so many of the things that you said, Darren, is what I would have said. Uh, but uh, some important points I would make would be that I would miss how outspoken he was about everything and honest and brutally honest. I mean, some people think, and in, maybe in some ways, John was very complicated, but he was a straight shooter. He told you how he felt. What some people have difficulty with is that he told you how he felt in the moment and then he can change his mind about the same thing a week later or a year later. He could be nasty about Paul McCartney in one interview and then uh, in another interview say that he's his best male friend. Mm -hmm. You know, that's the kind of person that John was. And it's very possible, like many of us, that we have conflicting feelings and emotions about a lot of things in life. And John exposed all those to us. And, um, you know, every now and then when you when you either read an interview with John or listen to an interview with John, you feel like you get to know him. for sure. that. Moment. And I miss that. And there were some really catastrophic times that we lived in in the world like 9 11 especially where i wish john was there just to say something at that time about how he felt it would have been a comfort to all of us i think because we all looked up to john so much but um 
Yeah, and then of course there's the music. I think that John was kind of unpredictable. You don't really know what would have followed um, Double Fantasy other than the songs that we know on Milk and Honey. But how much of an influence would Yoko have been on John's music? Yeah. Would have done songs like Walking on Thin Ice, which he was so proud of, you know? Um, would his albums have continued to be John and Yoko albums for the rest of his life? Or would he have gone back to being strictly solo albums? If you listen to the interviews he gave before he died, he was talking about artists that he liked at the time, like Blondie or the Talking Heads or Bruce Springsteen or the Cars. Um, you know, would his music have reflected that had he lived? And who knows with the changing musical styles, I've heard Yoko say that John would have loved rap. Who knows? I could see that. Yeah, I could see that. You know, um, I don't I don't know if he would attempt. You know, to incorporate it into his sound, but I could definitely see him into, you know, getting into rap and hip hop. Yeah. And would he have cared about being relevant the way that we know Paul does care so much, you know? Um, and also, I, I I feel really sad that he had two sons that didn't have a full... Re well, he did the most that he possibly could in the, in the five years he had with Sean, but he didn't have the full relationship with Julian that... I'm sure he would have appreciated and Julian would have craved for. And I do think that you know, Julian and Sean would have worked with John on their own music. But I think, uh, yeah, there's the music. And then there's just the fact that John told you exactly how he felt about everything. Mm -hmm. And I, that, you know, John could be in a real bad mood in one interview and then be completely upbeat in another. No matter what, he was never dull. <laughs> he was no. all fascinating mm -hmm. uh, in, in every conversation that he had. And um, and I happen to admire the way that he stood politically. And um, sometimes I get bothered by certain music fans who think that entertainers should just stick to their music or entertainment and not get involved in politics. But if you do that and you're sticking your neck out, and you're risking sales and your reputation, I think that takes guts, you know, and I admire artists that do that, whether I agree with their views or not. So I admired what John did in 1972 with some time in New York City. Um, and I grew to love those songs on, on the album as well. But anyway, um, those are my thoughts about, you know, what I miss most about John. And um, you guys came up with, uh, you know, Great comments on that. All right. So why don't we wrap things up by telling folks what's going on with us and where everyone can get in touch with us. Darren, we'll start with you. Oh, no, absolutely nothing's going on with me. It's boring as anyway. Um, yeah, if you want to look for me on Facebook, that's a great way. I've got two Facebook pages. You can send me a friend request to Darren DeVivo or you can forward up. Uh, um, not like it's now follow. I think the like button's gone. Mm -hmm. You follow a page. And I have uh, another page, Darren DeVivo, WFUV DJ and Beatles podcaster. Uh, either way, I'll get you on the other one. Not that it really matters if you're on both. Um, you can listen to me on WFUV and I'd love that. Uh, I'm on, uh, on WFUVs at 90.7 FM in New York City. Um and also 90.7 FM H HD2. And you can catch me Monday nights uh, starting at 10. Monday night, 10 to uh, 2 a.m. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, four nights a week. And then Saturday afternoons from 1 until 4. And uh, if you aren't in the New York City area, you can listen online, WFEV.org and on our app. And uh, that's it. Okay. Alan? Yeah, you can find me on Facebook under either Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remix. There is a Facebook page for the McCartney Legacy. And you can write to all of us here at Things We Said Today Radio Show 
at gmail.com. Okay. As for me, you can email me at every little thing at att.net. Every little thing is my weekly Beatles show on the radio. If you want to listen to it, there is a page on my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, called Every Little Thing. It lists all the radio stations that carry the show. And when it's broadcast, you can go directly to their websites and stream them. Okay, that all that information is on uh, my website, where you can also find weekly Beatles trivia, where you can win great prizes every single week, including the McCartney Legacy Volume 1. Uh, it's 10 prizes to pick from there. I also have my other talk show podcast, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. We've been on hiatus for a couple of months, but we're coming back probably on October 9th on John's birthday, Monday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, live on our YouTube channel. And it'll be a tribute show to John. And uh, I'm sure we'll be talking about the Mind Games album and hear what my other co-hosts feel about it. 50 years later again that's talk more talk a solo beatles video cast and then there's ken michaels radio my youtube channel lots of conversations all about the beatles and lots of uh beatles trivia shows including one where darren just appeared he's been on two shows we'll see if he is actually the winner of that show or is it andy nichols from the two legs podcast who has won four shows in a row he could be a five-timer, which is as far as you can go on my channel with that. Lots of uh, great trivia in those shows about the Beatles on the group and on the solo careers of them. And that's at uh, Ken Michaels Radio. Always new interviews coming on that channel. So uh, if you can, please subscribe to that, Ken Michaels Radio. Talk more talk a solo Beatles video cast. And if you haven't done so here, please do so for things we said today. And by the way, thanks to all of you who have written to us um, on the YouTube channel and all the audio uh, platforms that we're on. We really appreciate it. We love reading your comments here. And um, if you have any suggestions for us for a show that you'd like for us to do, please write to us. Okay. And uh, we just gave the email address things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. Mm -hmm. All right. Thanks so much for tuning in, Alan, Darren. It's been great doing this tribute show for John. We miss you, John. We love you, John. You're always in our hearts. Thanks to all of you for watching, and we'll see you next time.